Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So thank you for joining me in this short presentation. I am hopefully going to propose a simple, cheap and available way of recording radiation and hopefully it will capture strange radiation birdies and tracks from various experiments that you might like to undertake and it may also be able to provide uh, multiple layer effects which we will briefly discuss in this overview. Now in this slide that you see here, this website from Imaging Resources, it discusses the well-known story of how Kodak discovered that the nuclear testing under the Manhattan Project was actually going on and after they alerted the authorities, they were told by the authorities when the tests were going to occur so that they could prepare for them. And in this article here called Not So Secret Atomic Tests, Why the Photographic Film Industry Knew What the American Public Didn't. And a couple of points that are useful here. Photographic film is particularly radio sensitive. That's the reason why you see dosimeters made from this stuff as they can be used to detect gamma, x-ray and beta particles. But in 1946, Kodak customers started complaining about film they had bought coming out fogged. And so this is an example of fogged film. So it's like it's already pre-exposed before it was exposed in the camera. And in fact, fogging has been used by many Lena researchers as a way of establishing that there is some form of radiation. And I think there's an example by Shunavazan at Babar Atomic Research Center where they observed fogging on x-ray film. And also Russian researchers have used this extensively, some of which I will refer to today. And one example would be Alexander Shishkin with his water cavitator where he observed his birdies. Yeah, so it's about you know, something had gone on with the Trinity test and then there were some reviews about this and there were some complaints about the fact that the photographic industry knew about these tests that were going on that were producing this uh, radiation. And there were some discussions later on about the fallout and how American children and, and other people were exposed to this radiation with no warning, but that the photographic industry were told about it. So obviously photographs were a very important part of culture at the time. There wasn't so much the availability of television and other forms of screen video back then. And so uh, photographs were the way you recorded images of people's lives. And so and ending up with something like this when you wanted to take a picture of grandma um, probably would have upset people. Anyway, researchers in this field, as I said, have been using x-ray film for many, many years. And one most recently that we've talked about is Lion. And Lion used self-developing dental x-ray film and exposed film using the Lion reactor core. And it resulted in these two spots, which uh, led me down a very interesting path of learning. Now, these things are two centimeters by three centimeters, and you can see obviously there's a, some lost area on the corner there. Another example would be the work of Perev Vozchikov, and he used some standard 35 millimeter film like this and exposed some water in a Petri dish sealed to the sun for a couple of weeks thereabouts. And underneath they had some strong neodymium magnets producing a field of half a Tesla. And then they fired a small laser at the water that was exposed for this period of time next to some film. And they saw these traces on here. Now, if you actually look at the traces, we can see these kind of bead chains rolled out. And we've seen this kind of structure on polymer that's been exposed to radiation emitted from echo fuel. And then these spots all over the film. The interesting thing about using film is that you can accumulate exposures of particle collisions over time. So you can actually quantify the number of emissions by the amount of exposure that you give to the source. And if we look here, there discussion here is quite important for potentially the nature of strange radiation. It says the flatness of the tracks is quite understandable within the framework of our concept. In the magnetically interlocked chain, the field between adjacent microdrops is mostly locked in a small area. 
External interaction is possible only for micro droplets at the ends of the chain. Therefore, the chain always clings to the film with its end and then lies flat in the plane of the film. So you can imagine a chain goes through and even though that the film, as you can imagine it, is rolled up in here because they had the unopened film, it would go through a couple of layers and then you know, dishevel and uh, one of the ends of the string would touch down, attach, and then it would unravel itself along the film. So it would, even though the film was curved, it would produce a flat track along the film. This is what they are suggesting is going on. It's quite a reasonable suggestion. Note that if the chain of magnetic moments closes, its interaction with the environment through which the chain spreads weakens. In this case, the closed chain can spread over long distances through any condensed media with little or no interaction. Indeed, our experiments have not found media that could serve as screens for the radiation in question. The weak interaction of closed chains leads to another effect. The traces on the film are randomly arranged. An object that is able to leave a mark on a film can pass through dozens of layers of film without interaction and then leave a mark on only one layer. Judging by the blackening of the trace, including individual micro droplets, it can be assumed that the lightening of the film is due to the complete transition of the rest mass of micro droplets into the ionization energy of the photosensitive layer. So they're showing that there are these random tracks all over it. And they found these spots and birdies. And when we look at some of the birdies, they can be stretched out. And here's a less stretched out one. They always have these tails. And here's a near perfect one. And here is the microstructure of this macro level image. And they're saying that these birdies can have a scale which is uh, really quite large. I think it's three to eight millimeters. Figure seven. Figure seven shows a fungus shape. And uh, if you imagine your mushroom chopped in two, that's what you would have. These figures are observed quite often. The size of the cap is from three to eight millimeters. And the thickness is from one to three millimeters. But the leg of the fungus is sometimes not fixed. Figure 8 shows, with a large magnification, the fine structure of the fungus head in the form of a wave system with a characteristic size of 30 microns and similar to a shock wave trail as recorded in aerodynamics experiments. There's the wave system. And so they're saying that the head here across that diameter there is from 1 to 3 millimeters. And that becomes important when you're looking at the type of resolution of film that you might want to use. Now I'm going to include all these links in the description of the video and in the blog. Okay, so there came a suggestion by one Matt Lowe in Australia. He was looking for a way to measure the radiation and he wrote this, I came across an interesting method of detecting x-rays. Perhaps this has been mentioned before, but it is new to me. It might be handy for imaging strange radiation. Take a photo of nothing, lens cap on, with a Polaroid instant photo. And for the next 20 seconds, it is sensitive to x-rays, but not white light. Link to source. So here is the source. And this is the guy here. So thank you to the author of this website. Again, I will link. It's a guy called Noah. And he has this x-ray emission device and he actually used a standard Polaroid film and he actually attempted to produce an x-ray with the packet closed and in fact it completely saturated it so it goes completely white here so if we open this in a new tab this is what he got and this is not very useful this is not going to tell you much information but he actually has an x-ray generator like a big source of x-rays and so we're going to look at the packet in a minute of these type of self-developing films so what he did was as matt lowe said on the xeno blog here this is the xeno blog on quantumheat.org site at martin fleischmann memorial project site he let it come out and then exposed it shortly afterwards. And what he's saying is that he found that 
after it's done its initial exposure, the film is still sensitive to x-rays for a short period afterwards. And that enables him to post-expose it and get an x-ray image. And you can get some quite effective x-ray images. Now, the thing about what we're doing is we are not going to be producing a massive amount of x-rays. And if the sort of example here is relevant where they used a closed film container then I would expect that we wouldn't have the problem that he had when he produced this image so rather than doing what he did which is to take the photo with the lens covered let the Polaroid or the instant film come out and then post expose it in this case he lists the two second exposure two second exposure and this wasn't exposed for long enough we actually do the exposure in the packet and then take a photo in the machine that you use to start the development process and then let it develop and this would allow us to have a long exposure time now what do i mean about exposure and accumulating data well if you go back to this one you can see all these spots here with maybe a close-up on some of the spots there. This is essentially what Alexander Parkmov was doing in his work in Space Earth Human. And I have the book here and you can see here he's saying a fragment of a photogram obtained in one of the experiments. It says, spark chambers with glass electrodes are successfully used in nuclear physics experiments. A feature of our devices is the presence of film in the gap between the electrodes, which makes it possible to produce a long-term accumulation of information with fixed coordinates of events without the use of complex equipment. So he has some film here, some insulator, some glass plates, and they have a voltage between them. And this might be something you could consider adding into the detector to simulate this type of detector. And this was for detecting what he was originally calling N radiation from the cosmos or from other devices. So this is one method. But if I show you here, this is in the uh, Steps to the Discovery of Electronuclear Collapse by Takaki Matsumoto, Dr. Takaki Matsumoto. Um, this will be in the published one-to-one -one copy that you will be able to download from Remote View. And in this article here, Extraordinary Traces Produced During Pulsed Discharges in Water, you'll be able to read through it. There are these uh, ring traces here and here and there are more examples in the next paper as well uh, which is essentially the same thing so we've got these group traces here over here and over here and if we go to here this is where it's kind of come in and bounced and gone and dragged along and gone to there and uh, here again it's gone along the surface and uh, moved around and he did a similar thing where rather than just having the one film he had film with separators of acrylic plates which were one millimeter so you had your emulsion acrylic plate emulsion acrylic plate emulsion acrylic plate emulsion acrylic plate emulsion okay and then he could see how many traces he got on each individual x-ray film uh, nuclear emulsion so he got zero on the first one but by the time it gone through the acrylic plate um, he got two traces here, or rather this is actually zero, and this is uh, 20 here on one on the back side maybe, and on the front side he got uh, 29. And over here there was maybe uh, two on the front side and none on the back side. And on this one it had, oh, I don't know, about six on the front side and uh, maybe two again on the back side. And then none and none and none, okay? So it didn't seem to affect the first emulsion. So it is important. And, and this is what Perebyshkov uh, is also saying in his work that we are referring to here, that it, it goes through layers. And then, as Ken Shoulders would say, the impedance change causes it to dishevel. And the, as Alexander Shushkin would say, it explosively unpacks, producing these birdie-type structures here. Okay, so 
What is he describing here is going on? Figure 10 shows a conceptual view of the recording of the third kind uh, of traces, the combined rings. A rotating and vibrating ring generated by the discharge might enter the nuclear emulsions. While passing through the emulsion, material and acrylate plates, it somewhat loses its kinetic energy, mainly between the first and the second emulsions. The moving ring can be trapped and leave a ring trace on the surfaces it touches. The ring could have an electrical charge, so it hops up and down in the space between the emulsions while touching the surface of the nuclear emulsions. A portion of the electrical charge could transfer from the ring to the emulsion. Then a static electrical repulsive force could work between the ring and the nuclear emulsion to make the ring jump up. Many ring traces could be left before the moving ring escapes from the space. When the ring moves on the surface, a continuous trace should remain as shown in figures 6E and F, like jumping up and down and moving along the surface, jumping up, jumping up and moving along the surface and there. So, so he's saying that there is a torus and it is rotating around. It comes through the first uh, emulsion without any interaction and then it goes it through the space and it comes and hits the second emulsion here and it's jumping up and down, jumping up and down, moves along the surface, jumps up, gets reflected off this nuclear emulsion and comes back down and hits the plate again, the, the nuclear emulsion again, creating these kind of traces. And I think that's quite plausible. Now, one could suggest maybe that it's, it's either a torus or you could even think that this was a sphere and what you're looking at is the double layer. And I will try and simulate these type of traces with both types of effect and see what we can see using computer generated images. I think that either would produce the trace. Certainly this does look like the sort of thickness of a double layer and we do know that these things produce balls. So it actually could just be a ball that is coming through and producing these ring traces. So that is that. So what are we comparing? Well, we have these. This is the self-developing X-ray. And what you have is a two by uh, three uh, centimeter, so 600 millimeters squared in here, approximately, uh, about less the edges. And this is the developing fluid in here. It's the pouch in here. And you burst this and you roll it through and it comes through here and it develops this. And it's all a bit fiddly. The chemical can get onto your hands. It stains things and you have to wash it off and so on. But Lion's innovation to use this was good. But they tend to come from India where they're still used in dental practices. And they can cost $40 and take three weeks to arrive. And so this option of using these Instax, uh, really interesting to me. And so what we've got on the side here, it says protect from x-ray. And I like the fact that it says that um, because obviously it's sensitive to x-ray. So we like that. And if we look at these uh, inside here, um, you can see they come foil wrapped. And you would imagine that the reason that they're foil wrapped is because that is protecting them from x-ray. So what I would do with the supernova reactor and with other devices uh, that we might want to test is to actually use the whole pack, uh, unwrap it, and then uh, potentially to guide radiation towards the uh, particular sample detector plates. We would take the strong neodymium magnet and put it like with the north on one set and the south on another set. And then we would have a control set somewhere array, way, maybe in another room from the reactor uh, unwrapped to provide a control. The other interesting thing about these is that the area on here is 600 millimeters, as I said. Uh, this is around about 4,644 millimeters squared, 86 millimeters by 54 millimeters. So each one of these has an active photographic area of seven and a three quarters times the area of this. So you might get 50 of these, but you kind of got to divide it by seven and three quarters. And uh, in this pack here, this pack actually cost 
around about the same as a little bit less actually than this and you're getting 50 uh, 10 sheets times five packs so you're actually getting 50 of these but you're getting seven and three quarters times the area so the accumulation area is much higher with these now this is approximately 300 dpi in here so it's, it's about the same resolution as a laser printer and for the head of those uh, mushrooms uh, that were observed by many authors uh, you would be looking at, at potentially three to eight millimeters which at the very low end would be 36 dots and eight millimeters would be 96 dots of resolution and i think it was one to three or four or whatever it was millimeters across so you're still going to get a fair level of understanding of what these traces are if this works so i'm really interested to find out you know whether this will do the job and then this is the camera i haven't even opened it yet but essentially you would expose your film and then you would put it in the camera you would run them out of the camera again with the lens covered <laughs> so you didn't double expose it and then you would put it face down and wait for it to develop and hopefully we will see some results so i'm really interested to find out whether this works if it does work this means um, that you can get these pretty much everywhere all around the world in in the past i have used 10 by 7 inch large format film the film was really expensive it was difficult to find someone to develop it uh, obviously it's a massive area but then you know it's 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 just hugely expensive and like i say a pack of these is equivalent to the price of a pack of these and you can just go to your local camera shop and actually like i did today and pick these up you know there's no delay if you need more testing you can do it you can literally pack these around your cavitation device around your microwave reactor around your inductive discharge strange radiation generator all, all kinds of things and then you just need one of these and and this was i think it was it was discounted because it's the old model and it doesn't matter you don't need any of the fancy models you don't want ones that actually take a digital photo and then expose the film to the digital photo you don't want that um uh, so this was i think it was about about seventy dollars sixty dollars um but once you've got that that is your your capital cost and then you can um keep uh, buying these and uh, with these large areas and, and uh, you know th th there's no development you know and you don't need to be messy like you are with these you can get these in black and white as well and that might i don't know provide a higher contrast it would be interesting to see if some of the layers in the color film are more sensitive to whatever comes out of the reactor than others but additionally, it might be that this has multiple layers in it, whereas a black and white layer, uh, a black and white film might only have one uh, layer in it. So you might find it has higher resolution in black and white or higher fidelity over and above, you know, because it's a single color and that the strange radiation is able to get through. Anyway, there's lots of things to look into and I'd be very interested to see what you guys come up with. If we can see these kind of things, and you can actually see this is on a 35 millimeter film and for those that know the size of the holes on the 35 mil film, you can actually work out the scale of these features on this film. And I expect this will work. So I'm quite encouraged by this. I have to thank Matt Lowe for suggesting this. And this is the power of uh, open research. You get to share ideas. And uh, if this works, it's going to be a really, really easy way for the community to work with detection of strange radiation. And from that point of view, you will be able to put these kind of films next to your reactor and behind potential screens and therefore there will be a potential to establish that a screen is actually able to protect against strange radiation so if we can use these to develop effective strange radiation shields then that in itself will be a huge win for the research community so with that i'll say thank you very much for your time and i will see you in the next video